Finding a Memory, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 16 Henry, the sparrow equivalent to Bernie the pelican, appeared at the step to the book barrow, his beady gull eyes staring at her. The stare was a demand for broken cookies or muffin bits. Mallory ordered herself not to yield, but those odd, pale gull eyes sent a shiver through her. Why don't I remember gulls being so creepy? She tossed half a cookie, and Henry bolted for it. A stack of books waited for wrapping and delivery, which she might as well start now. Sometimes Mallory wondered if entire days on Sparrow were worth it. She could take orders, arrive on the island, tootle around to deliver said orders, and leave. Done. But Ezra would arrive in a while, and that would make all the difference. They'd schemed about it for days now, and only that morning had Ezra said, Why don't you take me over and introduce me? Then she'll tell you about seeing Mr. Grace again, and voila! Every time Ezra threw in a French word or phrase, Mallory had an even stronger desire to pack up everything and go home with her. Surely the Swamali Islands needed a mobile bookstore, and surely it wouldn't mean cashing out her retirement fund to get hers there. That prompted a sigh. Who was she kidding? Of course it would. She'd dug into a cupboard for more cups when Ezra nudged her. Didn't you say Miss Patty rides a red bicycle? Yeah. She's here. The instant feeling of getting caught with a fistful of forbidden cookies made Mallory go cold. Really? Mm-hmm. Ezra gave her a long look and added, Want me to greet her? Introduce myself? Feel out the situation? Call her a coward, but Mallory just squeaked out a, Please! and began praying like nobody's business. Ezra had mad reconnoitering skills. The girl stayed close to the steps and spoke in clear tones that even the stiff ocean breeze couldn't drive out of range. Hi, beautiful bicycle. You're laying on that Swamali accent a bit, aren't you? Morning. You're one of Mallory's stand-ins. I wanted to talk to her. Oh, no. While she couldn't actually see it, Mallory felt as if she did. Ezra would have thrust out a hand right then. I'm Ezra Nehemiah Keel, Mallory's friend from way back, just visiting. Right there, Ezra probably cocked her head and used those wide, gorgeous puppy dog eyes on Miss Patty. And you are? Patty Mercer. The sound of a kickstand being lowered followed. Now, where would you be from? I hear an accent that isn't Jamaican or French or Creole or anything else, but it has some of that exotic flavor of all of them. So I'm Ailey, ma'am. My parents were missionaries. Dad still is. I'm his sort of assistant. South Pacific? A moment later, Miss Patty laughed. Delightful. I always wanted to see that part of the world, but since I've not seen much more than the southeastern seaboard of the good old U.S., I doubt I'll ever go anywhere else. It was time for Mallory to get her rear in gear before Miss Patty got suspicious. She burst out of the trailer with a smile plastered on her face and prayed it looked genuine and natural. Miss Patty, sorry, stupid cups. The interested expression on Miss Patty's face dissolved into something Mallory couldn't identify. Oh, sweet girl. And a tear rolled down her cheek. What's wrong? That may have been what she said, but the real question Mallory wanted to ask was, What have I done? The woman's lips pursed tight to stop a slight tremble. Those eyes filled and overflowed. I have a confession, Mallory, honey. The diary was mine. As much as she'd wanted to, Mallory couldn't pretend she hadn't known. She just nodded and pulled the woman into a big old hug. I know. I'm sorry. I felt so bad when I found out, but then I remembered you telling me to keep reading, so I thought... 
Miss Patty stepped back and moved to lower herself into one of the chairs encircling the ice cream tables scattered around the store. Between breaks and starts, Miss Patty offered assurances that she'd wanted Mallory to read it, had wanted someone to understand the foolish choices of a silly girl who wanted to be grown up before her time. I uh, hadn't reread it in ages. I uh, hope it wasn't. It was raw, real, and beautiful. It hurt me to see someone so loving being so unloved. She sighed. And yet, I think John did love you in the best ways he could. Miss Patty nodded. He did. I wrote about big things. I didn't write the day-to-day -day moments that added up to big things, both good and bad ones. I wanted that diary to last me until I died so I'd start to write down him picking a flower while we were on a walk. The way he'd give it to me and say, I wish I could give you more, Patty. But then I'd think I'd run out of pages too soon for all those little things. But you stopped writing in it after you moved back here. Why? Patty fidgeted with the hem of her shirt as if the most important thing she could do. I wanted to put John behind us. I wasn't pretending none of it had happened, she hastened to add. Mama always said I did that, but I didn't. Just speaking those words seemed to give the woman a bit of spark again. I wanted to close the book on that part of my life, so to speak. Ezra spoke up this time. I'm not going to pretend I haven't heard this or that Mallory hasn't told me about the journal. Mallory and Miss Patty both turned to look at her as she settled herself beside them. So, I'm going to say something. They stared at her until she nodded and got back to the point. Right. Well, this is it. I think you should go talk this out with Mr. Grace. He's a kind man, and... The laughter that bubbled over from Miss Patty dried the woman's tears, but sent her hands trembling again. I have. He was on my porch Tuesday night when I came home. The younger women stared at each other before turning back to her. Mallory found her voice first. What did he say? The tears fell again. He still loves me. Always did. Even when he married his Gina, she knew part of him. While Patty mopped at her eyes with the back of her hand, Ezra hopped up to retrieve napkins. Why would she marry him knowing that? Did you ask him? Patty shook her head. I didn't know if I should. A deep voice behind her nearly sent Mallory through the roof, except there was no roof, or even a canopy. You should. She hopped up and flung her arms around him both eager for his reassurance and for a moment to tell him she hadn't admitted they'd seen Patty and Frank together. She's talking and... I used to be like that, eager to greet Francis the moment he arrived. Those words wilted the dear lady. Now I shake and doubt and... Those watery eyes turned their way as she whispered, I'm not the same girl he loved back then. Too much has changed and changed me. Benjamin held out Mallory's chair for her and pulled a fourth from a nearby table. He settled in, seated backward on it, arms resting across the back, and leveled his gaze on the woman. Miss Patty, if he only loved the girl you were, he didn't love you. He just loved things about you. After letting that sink in a moment, he continued, Folks change and grow as they get older. You have to love who they are and will be. Frank's the kind of man who understands that. He reached across and took one of her trembling hands. Frank loves you, not just his memory of you. For weeks, Mallory had considered herself in love with Benjamin Hornigold. She'd been wrong. She knew it because, with those words, her heart moved from her keeping and settled itself irrevocably in Benjamin's care. During their short engagement, 
Patty had enjoyed one recurring daydream. Already, her favorite part of the evening had been that moment she heard the gate scraping as Francis pushed his way through. She'd run and fling herself at him, happy, carefree. She'd left that girl behind hiding in some corner of some closet in Skimmer Cottage, never to be seen again. Maybe I can unearth her somewhere. Patty mused as she pulled her marinating chicken from the fridge and began dredging it through the breading she knew she shouldn't be using. But nobody made better fried chicken than Patty Mercer, and her Francis had loved it. Besides, the daydream. This was her chance. She'd always imagined the sound of Francis calling out from the door, I'm home, and her leaving supper preparations to run to greet him. Her friends, who had big dreams and feminist leadings, had mocked her for wanting to be a mere housewife, but Patty hadn't cared. She'd make a good home for Francis and the half-dozen children she also imagined for them. That dream had died on her honeymoon with John, but tending the green beans and bacon on the back burner and watching the chicken sizzling with a practiced eye brought them back and settled them in her heart again. I'm here in my kitchen, not Mama's kitchen, mine. And I'm making supper for Francis. He'll be here. Will it maybe be home someday? Soon? Maybe I'll get that good evening kiss, and wouldn't that be a delight? With the precision of an actor on the stage, a muffled knock came at the door. A second one, and this time Patty recognized it as a kick. She fought her apron strings as she ran through the house and tossed that apron on the couch as she passed. Flinging open the door, she came to a stop when a Christmas tree nearly poked in her belly. So much for flinging my arms around him like I was 18 again. Is it safe to step in? She moved out of the way and called him forward. Francis Grace, what are you doing with a Christmas tree big enough for Rockefeller Center? After wrestling the thing inside and leaning it against the door, Francis turned to beam at her. I've missed a lot of Christmases with you. We needed something big to kick off the next 20 or 30 together. That's when Patty learned a truth no one had ever bothered to share with her. You could take a girl, marry her off, give her a hard life, add stretch marks, labors, and teen angst. You could make her a widow before she was 40 and teach her self-reliance and steadiness. But the moment her first true love returned, she'd be that uncertain girl again, hoping against hope that he'd hold her, kiss her, tell her he'd waited his whole life just for her. And the amazing thing is, he did. The kiss held something their first ones never could have. There was a richness and a depth to it that swept her heart into a swirl of emotions she'd never before felt and hoped never to lose. Maybe it was the tentative touch combined with incongruous confidence. Perhaps it was the knowing that decades of aloneness were over. Both, she decided. And one more thing. It's the feeling of being home at last. Wanted that kiss the other night, Francis murmured against her lips. I think I'm glad I managed to resist. I needed you too, but... I didn't want you to. I suspected. His fingers trailed along her temples, down her cheeks, along her jaw. His thumb traced the outline of her lips. I never forgot a single millimeter of your face. Patty snorted at that, but she wrapped her arms around his middle and would have settled there. The scent of frying chicken killed that moment, however. Supper! With that, she snatched her apron from the couch and tied it back on as she raced back to the kitchen. The chicken wasn't even ready to turn over yet. Phew! Arms slid around her waist. His lips brushed her earlobe as Francis bent low and said, I used to dream about this moment. I'd come home from work and you'd be fixing supper, just like this. He 
He kissed her cheek and stepped away to lean against the cabinets and watch her. I uh, didn't imagine it would take over 40 years to have it, though. It would kill the emerging, glowing haze between them, but Patty had to ask. Gina worked? No, sometimes volunteered. Frances reached out and stroked her arm for a moment. I had similar moments with her. He waited until she looked at him. They are still precious memories. I learned to love my wife, Patty. But she wasn't you. I dreamed of you in those days. And she knew about me. She knew about you and prayed for you. She was certain you'd regretted your decision. I brushed that off as her natural bias in my favor. She was right. I hadn't made it to the hotel room before I realized what an idiot I'd been. If I'd been Catholic, I'd have gone straight to a priest and begged him to help me get it annulled. Patty froze. Was it true? Had it been that bad so soon? No, it hadn't. It had been awkward and not so romantic. But it hadn't been truly bad until that choking incident. But what was true is that she would have asked for that annulment almost the moment she said I do if it had been a possibility. Gina always had a good sense about these things. She knew I'd come to love her when she asked me to marry her. She knew how to make me comfortable for not being able to turn off my love for you while turning on my love for her. And she knew how to help me grieve her loss even before she went. I could never have done that. He married a better woman than I could ever have been. Patty, please don't let me have said that aloud. She shot him a quick look before turning back to turn over the chicken pieces. Hmm? If I'd had my way, and even if I had to do it over again, I'd have married you that morning in his eye community church. It was the deepest desire of my heart for nearly a decade. As a tear slid down her cheek, he brushed it away and stepped closer to cradle her head to his chest. It still is. I'll marry you there tomorrow if you'll have me. She'd have agreed if he hadn't spoken again and forced her to take a moment to think. But I also know the Lord answers prayers when he sees fit. If he wanted us to have these years apart, there must be a reason. I trust that. Still overcome with all the emotions, Patty blurted out, Mallory wants to write our story. The diary is gone, so she wants us to fill in all the pieces. She thinks it would make a wonderful novel. I believe her words were, Nicholas Sparks will eat his heart out. The oven beeped, and she pulled out a small casserole dish of au gratin potatoes. Can you put these on a hot pad on the table? Patty had the bowl of green beans waiting when he returned. Without her even asking, he also pulled plates from the cupboard and began setting the table. See, Lisa, having those glass doors isn't silly. Anyone can help without having to ask for every little thing. They worked in silence, him setting the table and getting their drinks, her finishing up the fried chicken and trying to settle her nerves. Had he meant it? He had, hadn't he? Frances Grace wouldn't mention marriage in a flippant manner. Only when they'd seated themselves and Frances took her hand to ask the blessing did he speak again. I uh, meant it, Patty Love. I'll ask you to marry me a dozen times a day until you say yes. At first, all she could do was nod. Then, a bit of her old sassy self rose up within her. She picked up a fork and leveled him with her most piercing gaze. You do that, and I might even say yes one of these times. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.